Welcome to Alternate Endings. Half audiobook. Half podcast. Full apocalypse. This time, we discuss the short story from our last episode and walk through the real-world implications of this kind of apocalypse. Hello, and welcome to the recap episode of Resolution End here on Alternate Endings. My name is Tyler. Yeah, boy, Ivan Wayne. Uh, We are here today to discuss our uh, most recent episode about a pre-planned war. Conspiracies can go on forever and ever about what war isn't pre-planned, obviously to some extent or degree, but this one is full on just for the purpose of population decimation. First idea, it's kind of like what you just mentioned with war. It's kind of like first degree murder happens when it's not uh, pre-planned, right? It's almost accidental. Second degree is it was intentional but not planned. And third degree is like pre-planned, right? Premeditated. And you mentioned that some war is premeditated, but it's not always the case where both sides agree and that it's going to start on this day because usually assholes be trying to be sneaky and get in, and s- launch some sort of attack, switch allies, kill or do one something. specific person. Yeah. Exactly. I thought it would be a an interesting idea to not only have it be still secret. There's always some sort of secrecy, but to have at least the world powers that the head of each country to know what's going on and to try and keep that under wraps and how how do a vast majority of the people not know the full truth there has to be some sort of list and even in the story there there is a one point where the person in charge is so hesitant about knowing what he's doing there is some sort of premeditation and like choosing sides and flipping sides but there has never been a war to this scale i mean world war 2 did not come close to anywhere near everyone in the planet every nation contributing people to go out and fight so for a war where it's and and they keep allies close i mean a lot of and not always necessarily real close but like you think about western europe and world war ii obviously besides germany a lot of that western side was against them like you want to Mm -hmm. keep the people around you for safety can you imagine a war where it's almost like picking names out of a hat Like, all right, so the United States first, and they're going up against uh, Mexico. Okay, and then uh, let's see. Over here, we've got uh, Australia. Yeah, oh, you lucked out because New Zealand's on your team already. But what happens like in those small countries in Europe or in, in Africa where it's like you're the one little country in between and just out of sheer... I mean, in this case, they chose teams, but just from that all of a sudden you're surrounded you know there's absolutely nothing you can do what happens if you're the switzerland in the middle Mm -hmm. that decides to go against them just because of that all of a sudden you're surrounded by all enemies who they don't care they just want to live so they're going to kill you first obviously Mm. you mentioned playground games issues of red rover and it really makes this comparison easy for me because I've always thought about war as kind of this messy playground experience where you have these big bully kids who go around telling other countries what they should and shouldn't do. You got kids who have good intentions, but things don't work out well. You have the small scrawny kids who don't have a lot of resources. You have people who stay neutral, some who uh, have been friends with each other for a long time, you know, before that schoolyard romp or whatever occurs. It, It really makes me think that in the issue of something like World War Two, World War One, where countries start shoring up and you're either on side A, side B, or you're in the mix somewhere, it can make you feel very vulnerable and, and unprepared. Because, you know, imagine being in a situation, especially like you mentioned Europe, if you happen to be land-wise next to countries and um, some sort of conflict begins then you're right there and you may not be able to do anything about it even if like switzerland is notoriously neutral may get pulled in or you may get attacked and you don't even want any part of the war or you may be a country who's out of the loop and you don't even know what's going on and something happens to you and and that's what makes it so difficult is that it's not even necessarily 
at least from how they proposed it, it's not even necessarily about who you're already friends with. They even talk about, and Iran talks about, all right, so, mm. uh, or Israel. I, th- I think it was Israel. They talk about, all right, there's no more hate between anybody else. We're just going to be friends all of a sudden now because we got picked on the same team, so we're going to fight together. How accurate could that actually be? I mean, how can you all of a sudden go back to your people without telling them, hey, we're fighting a war for fun. We just want to get rid of a bunch of people. So like, if that were to ever be the case, they'd be like, all right, well, let's get rid of the people I hate. How are you going to be like, no, these are the teams. You Mm -hmm. only can attack this place or you can only attack this place. It's a big chess game, but instead of two, one against the other, there's 157 or however many countries there are all simultaneously going against each other and somehow trying to help or... And you, you brought it to the point. It's definitely is. It's it's it kind of is reminiscent of the schoolyard and and the dynamics of how it works. Like you said, there's the big bullies who are always gonna go somewhere. The popular kids. Yeah, exactly. Who have the most influence and people either can choose to follow and join in, or if they don't, they face the risk of either being the the one who's bullied or in this case being the one who whose population is wiped out. While I was listening to the story, one thought I had was, uh, what do you think? Do you think that this type of initiative and this type of war would have been able to be carried out and people actually not know besides the high level generals? Like, could something like this really pop off and the general population wouldn't find out about it until years later? I, they'd have to know. I, I just don't think it's possible to be able to, to rally that many people without, Especially nowadays, in the information era where basically everything's at your fingertips. If anything's ever online, it's essentially not safe from anyone. Someone's going to be able to find it. But at the same time, if every nation was for it, like obviously you're not going to get every single person in every country to be able to, to go fight. But once the war starts, people kind of have to join. I feel like it'd be the type of thing where almost like how the US is brought into World War II, where things are going so south that. You've got to go in and you've got to help, essentially, at that point. You realize, oh, I can suffer the consequences here, too. I need to make sure that that doesn't happen. So I feel like that would be the only way something like that could ever happen. I don't think ever for the reason of just to kill people, but a war of that scale, I think, is possible. Well, I could be very ignorant about how much our government knows without our knowledge and how much they're already perpetrating things and enacting plans years out in advance. Um, without our knowledge of anything. I've heard it likened multiple times that <clears throat> it's very interesting if you look at what people say on the campaign trail versus what they're like, even just a week or two into office. And people will joke and talk about hypothetical scenario that happens that when you win the presidency, you get invited into this very dark, smoky room. It's filled with cigar smoke and there's scotch on the table. And there's this big binder and all these people who you, you don't recognize them. And they tell you the way the world really is. That it actually is. The, and the all of a sudden. Dark secrets. Yeah. And all of, and the truths about what it will take to run a country like the United States of America. And perhaps there are things that we don't know and we may not know for another 20, 30, 50 years. Yeah. And so I really take this question seriously. Like, could we, you know, how far could it go before people figure it out? Because you know, there are so many mysteries. And even now, you know, that word redacted is very popular right now because of the Mueller report that yeah. came out most recently. But when the government chooses, even with Roswell, yeah. when they release papers 30 years later, to say, okay, we're going to let the population know something, but first we're going to take a black highlighter to it and you're not going to be able to read these parts. Yeah. Take away the There's actual something there. yeah, the actual truth of it and just give you pieces that we think makes it sound like the answer you want it's hiding in plain sight yeah it's literally like oh i'm gonna give you this bag of candy but i'm gonna take half of it in front of your face while you try to eat it on top of that i'm gonna make sure to take all of the best pieces possible i know you love those pink starburst (laughs) so that's the only one i'm going to take yeah because that just makes the most sense it's so difficult because war in general the u.s going to iraq way back in early what was that dude's 2000s 2002, 2003, yeah. maybe? It was, it was basically... We're not historians here. <laughs> yeah, no, unfortunately not. But part of it obviously was in retaliation for 9-11, but a lot of it was to go off and flex our guns. Be like, hey, Russia, like, 
Look yeah. at what we can do. Like a proxy like, don't, message. Exactly. Yeah. Like in everywhere. What the stuff going on in, in Venezuela right now. If I remember correctly, again, I need to read up more on my world facts. But I, I'm pretty sure Russia's, Russia is occupying Venezuela. And there's on top of the stuff of possibly going to Iran. Or we can also go to Venezuela. And it's These wars are fought somewhere else. Even though it might not, not necessarily be the main conflict. They're secretly fighting somewhere else just so they don't ruin their own home countries. Mm. So for it to be a war of this scale where you can fight anywhere at any time, like in all of those little excerpts, I wanted to make it seem like you never know where the person actually is. Mm. I mean, what side he they're said, on. E- exactly. You never know anything because I don't think they would either. You'd, they'd have these units that they pick up and, and place one place. And then they do whatever job, people come and go, people die. And then they pick them up and pull them somewhere else just to disorient. Mm. And the purpose is to kill as many people as possible. Mm. They don't watch it in the same place for too long. Commenting on getting into conflicts and keeping secrets and, you know, hiding and cloak and dagger type stuff. One part of the story I really enjoyed that I didn't see coming is when they start sounding off to the victor goes spoils or whatever they were saying. Yeah. So the victor belongs to spoils. And you could read into that and think that several countries have already made pre meeting packs that this, uh, you know, the splitting of the teams and the draft is about to happen for countries. But to think that some people were already colluding ahead of that is just people are trying to get a leg up on each other naturally. I mean, that's part of war. Even even in advance of this agreement of something that you know makes everyone possibly feel icky, but they've all agreed upon it. People are already screwing one another over before it's even started. You think about a reality TV show, take Survivor, Big Brother, any of those big ones. That people do that the whole time. If there is any chance that they can make sure they get closer to the end, whether it's in this case for money or in the case of war like you were just talking about they're totally going to they don't care about the rules they just want to make it to the end and Mm -hmm. i thought for me to the victor belong the spoils i i i'd always remembered hearing about it i mean i think it's iconic little phrase and then as i was i put it in there and i was like you know i actually want to make sure i get get it right because initially i wrote to the to the victor goes the spoils and i was like i don't know if that's actually right so i looked it up and it's to the victor belong the spoils, but that's just a little bit. It's uh, uh, William Marcy in 1832, who's a senator, was talking about the Democratic Party just coming into office and the uh, how it works. Uh, I don't know if it still necessarily works this way. Essentially, the new party gets to choose everything that happens. They get to place all their people. They get to do everything. And so he said they see nothing wrong in the rule that to the victor belongs the spoils. And so instead of... To the victor, to the victor belongs to spoils is like a like a oh yeah we won and this is so great like we get to do it. It's fully fully out. The full meaning is there's inherently something wrong with the idea that the winner gets to take everything. I mean it's just like mm. how in history from from now and in the past and forevermore history is written by the victor. I tried to somehow incorporate that, but at the same time there is no winner after a war like this. And so I want it to be plain cut and dry of here was as much of the meeting as we can possibly get. And then here's some TV 14 rated readings of the war. And this is, let me show you the truth on top of what they thought was going to happen. That has just another layer to it, right? Because it, unless people know that full quote, I would have never known that. And, and I would I have never either. known it was double handed. And And I think that's really what made me want to stick to it because initially I was only going to write it once and then all of a sudden I looked at it and I was like there is an entire extra layer that you just wouldn't ever think about I was trying to figure out what to do with Switzerland the whole time because as we talked about they are so notoriously known as as the the neutral party and so for a war like this to happen we're like all right everyone has to join we're going to pick sides so they abstain because they're like, I don't even want to vote no, because that puts me a part of this. And then possibly know some sort of secret behind what's going on. And so they have the knowledge of, hey, you're supposed to say to the victor, belong the spoils. Mm. And so instead, they do the whole quote, just as like a, a little slap in the face of, 
I see what you're doing. And that's what ultimately got them and we all got lose. them killed, yeah. And I don't agree that to the victor go the spoils because this is not the way it needs to be. No, not not at all. And I think possibly in their minds, it's not even necessarily to the victor, it's to the strongest. The and lucky. Exactly. Because there's so many factors that go into it. It was really fun to play around with with that specific phrase because I, I learned a lot about it. And And for those who don't know, you did a lot of research into what a UN meeting looks and sounds like. I don't want to say unfortunately because it was awesome to learn about. It was. Like it was something you I watched probably, a lot of C SPAN. Yeah. I did watch some C SPAN. <laughs> Thankfully YouTube has a bunch of live streams and I was literally sitting there probably about a week or two ago and I was like, Oh, I'm gonna see if I can find a YouTube clip on how the meetings sound and I type it in and there was literally a live meeting going on right now. And so I, I watched a portion of it and and I think when it's out of context it's it's really bland. <laughs> and so it terrified me while writing the story because I was like, how am I going to make a UN meeting even relatively entertaining? I Instead of watching one, I decided to go look at the rules more just to make sure that the meeting was running correctly. And for votes, you can question the um, the competency of the General Assembly. And that's technically supposed to suspend the meeting. To wait until later. But they or, didn't. But they didn't. Mm. And so you can also, you can ask for a revote. But to be able to get a revote of the initial matter, you have to vote on that. And everything basically is is on the two-thirds scale. To pass anything, it has to be two-thirds. Of the 157, 105 ends up being like 0.669 or something like that. Or it's, it's like 105, 106 that end up being the right there's 157 case, countries in the UN? I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, and on all the documents I was reading, it, it was out of 157 votes. You know, that right there strikes me as such a strong fact because this was decided to lower the world population. And there are way more than 157 countries. Yeah. So a lot of people were not even privy to the that that morning war would start and millions, billions of people would die, including a lot of people in their country. And not only did they maybe not, they didn't even get a chance to be neutral or pick a side. They just were ignorant to any of it. To any of it going on. Exactly. I mean, that's just part of the power of being in the United Nations and being Do you know how you get invited in? I don't actually. As a, as a whole, like to it, I, I read a lot about how you get elected. You need a certain number of votes and like the competency of that. A lot of what I was reading about was how to suspend, how to adjourn. One of the rules is you can either A, suspend it, B, adjourn it, C, adjourn that specific item, or D, close that specific debate. So it just it just ends from there. I was trying to think about how to incorporate any of that. And so I had Canada come in to try and be the one big brother that that's... I mean, they're a large country and very well known, who we would consider major power to go against it and mm. and I, I i didn't divulge their fate but i tried to not just because like like we were talking about earlier i didn't want i didn't want you to know who each person where they were what side they were on right who they fought because it, it didn't matter everyone was killing everyone essentially there is no good or bad side it's just whatever happens to you happens it, and that's it's, it's sometimes that just might be what war is you don't know both sides technically think they're in the right mm. So what makes one wrong and one right? The victor. The victor. <laughs> That's really all it is. See? <laughs> I really enjoyed the part where you said that there was a huge, the majority of the transcript and the, and most of it was redacted. You speculated that other countries could be speaking up. And I imagined countries who may have chosen to speak that I thought would be likely to happen. People who are kind of ashamed and disgusted, maybe even sad ahead of this. But they felt compelled to still vote yes for it. You know, people who are so torn, they realize that millions, billions of their own people are about to die. And yet they feel like it's for the greater good. You know, Japan kind of hinted at that, you know, what was included in the transcript. Yeah. But it's fun, to, you know, for you to put that on the listener to imagine what was in hundreds well, of redacted pages. Even more. Exactly. And that's a lot of these meetings last hours i was when i was reading facts <laughs> about it like full on there's been people who have spoke i think the longest was i want to say eight hours plus he had to take a break because he got lightheaded and Man, that's and was sick like and then had podcast. to stand up <laughs> yeah there's been some people who've spoke for four hours 
And so obviously you can't include something like that. But I wanted to probably the most important meeting they've ever had. It would be something like this. And so there needed to be a vast majority of it that wasn't there so that he couldn't have access to it. And so that's why I add a little bit of, hey, maybe some people were trying to fight against it. Maybe this literally all was just the process of choosing sides and being like, no, I want them. I want them. It, I did want the the listener to be able to think, hopefully someone realized, hey, I voted yes, because that's what everyone else was going to do. But then maybe they see, I mean, 96 people of the 105 needed to re-vote again did. So at least there, I mean, there was a, almost 100 representatives who were shaky, who were shaky. Yeah. So I can only imagine of those hundred, someone's going to stand up at that point. Well, think about it. even if you don't agree with this notion, but you know everyone's about to go to blows with each other to try to decimate the overall population. Saying no, or even stay, saying even staying neutral, makes yourself an instant target. And so people may hate the idea of this future war to reduce population, but they're going to vote yes, so they don't paint a huge target on yeah, their Yeah, they want to protect themselves. I mean, I, I didn't want to include who's captains or hmm. who any of the choices. I went back and forth on it. People, I think right now, if I were to go outside and ask a random person, hey, if the world had to split into two sides and they pick teams like schoolyard style, who do you think the U.S. would pick first? Who do you think the captain would be of both teams? It'd probably be the U.S. and, and China or U.S. and Russia. or I, Especially being in America, everyone mm-hmm. would say, oh yeah, the United States would definitely be a captain. But if you ask people in Germany, France, Britain, yeah. Egypt, Australia, would they say? Or, you know, it'd be interesting to do this actual live poll because what if they didn't include themselves? Yeah. There's like a weird layer of self-awareness there that's that, sketchy. Yeah, you, you just don't know. Just even that extra layer for people to think about you don't know how the meeting finished even though they said they'd release it and give people closure yeah they got a blip they know why the war was started but they have no idea what actually happened mm-hmm. in that meeting they got 3000 words of of explanation and why did you want to include the radio host was that to break up the UN meeting did you want someone to share their own thoughts i thought that was a, a nice touch i think i needed someone to be able to break up dry bits of of meeting. Because obviously in a meeting like this, people are going to get passionate. But when I was reading a lot of transcripts, it's so... I almost feel like people go in there to stroke themselves and make themselves <laughs> sound smart. Or if I wanted to include any of that, I knew I needed someone who... And, and picture this. This is after most of the world's already dead. So who's listening? who's going to be the person that they listen to. And so I imagine it's someone who doesn't care necessarily anymore about those powers. I I needed someone that could give a truthful interjection while the UN meeting was trying to make this war sound so good. And the person who gives us information can mean a lot, right? People who watch nightly shows, they talk about Letterman or Carson or Jay Leno, people or anchors like um, from my hometown back in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the same news anchors are still on TV today. When I go back and happen to see a random broadcast during a trip home from when you were, from when I was growing up and it's like, Oh, I know that person. And there's this weird like intermediary where, because it's a person, you know, I think it helps, you know, it helps the medicine go down or whatever that phrase is. It's yeah. I I mean, instead of it being the president or some other major face, It can be someone that they attribute truth, at least at that point, I would hope truth and like a real extra thought. If I'm honest, I didn't, I personally didn't picture it as a TV host. I pictured it as someone who's on a radio. Not many people are like, go back to the basics. How many people are out there filming nude film and TV? Hmm. I thought of it as there's a reason he can be in his house with his family. And it's because... He's recording on a microphone right. and sending it out. So he doesn't have a face that people have to attach this to, someone negative. It's just his opinion that he can get across. And well, whoever in charge thought he would be the best for it. Well, I think radio is just as powerful, if not more personal, right? Because these voices that you listen to are at some level almost in your head. Yeah, and, 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 and you, you can, can attach any visual representation you want. And especially with something like a podcast, like... 
Joe Rogan is an example, um, or NPR um, podcasts. People get used to the the voices and the personality that bring them things that they enjoy, and they attach onto that person. They feel like they know them at some point. And so do I want to digest uncomfortable news from reading something on Google search, or do I want to hear something about that same news story that's uncomfortable for me to hear from someone I trust? I'm going to go with that comfortable voice. Yeah. I mean, that's so entirely true. If I'm honest, I didn't even think of it in that way, but it just gives me some affirmation of, of my choice. Cause when I first started <laughs> writing it, I didn't have them in there. Yeah. It oh, was, really? it was just, it was just going to be the meeting, a transcript writing it. I took a break. Cause I was like, this is, I'm so bored writing this. <laughs> like it's all this research and it's just like, it feels so, I even said it in my thing. It felt so robotic. But once I added Arlo Dark, which I'm going to toot my own horn, great radio name. Anyone names a kid Arlo Dark, let me know. That was That's going to be your first child's name. It better be. Um, How'd you come up with that name? I, I googled top radio and TV names. No way. And I combined a couple names I liked. Interesting. I re- once I saw Dark, I wanted to play with This Is a Dark Future. Yeah, The Meeting was meant to create a better one, but it's it's worse. So I liked the dark. Mm-hmm. And then Arlo to me just sounded like, I mean, great name, great TV or reporter name on top of a little Star Wars, <laughs> a little Star Wars feel to it. Right. If I'm honest. Inside the rebellion. Exactly. You know, we've never talked about names before. And I don't know, I have never had the chance or the thought to bring this up, but most of the characters in the stories that I write, I will Google Names associated with blank. So in Heavy yeah, Forecast, smart. Kendra, Dylan, um, all the names in that story have water, ice, or weather origins to them. That's and crazy. And I've never explained that. Yeah. But I often... That's so funny because I've done the same. I just don't want to pluck names out of the ether, you know, and I really try to kind of avoid our friends' names yeah. <laughs> or people that we know because if they listen to the podcast, they'll be like, what the heck? You just yeah. took my name. That's what you think about me? Huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you think I'm that character? Yeah. Do you want me to die? <laughs> yeah. Reaching out for a name that doesn't sound obnoxiously random but also realistic but could have some underlying meaning yeah it's kind of fun i love that you do that too because entirely for me when for for the change i did the exact same if Mm. a lot of the names uh nova kelvin they're all science based names and so that's so funny that you've picked specific for years too and we we've literally never talked about that before i know and that's because it plays such a underlying meaning that i think secretly we hope people pick up on it's hard to fully get when and sometimes a name is just a name yeah and i don't feel like it always needs explanation either no, you know no. like um i came up with in the previous story second chance melvin letzer i came up with the name melvin because it just sounded like a billionaire who <laughs> yeah. would be obsessed yeah. with dinosaurs for some reason <laughs> i'll admit my bias there yeah and i made up the last name and and it works it, I, I think there are certain sounds and phonetic that you can just attach a- attach that whatever meaning to it. If you place that name in a certain scenario, people are going to be like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Or like, that's a good name for that person. They're, I know this is almost off topic, but you bring up the thought of billionaires. And, and I had so I was doing some research before we met today and I because I wanted to look at if the idea of population control through war has ever been brought up or if like any smaller wars um and i couldn't find anything specific about that but i did find the article is titled the dark history of population control so i knew i needed to look into it (laughs) because you never know but i guess in 2009 there was a a group of billionaires who met basically to talk about um all the problems with climate change and mass hunger and all these different things that are basically because of population control and they obviously there wasn't any since 2009 there hasn't been a gigantic drop in in population by any means um, but i thought it was super interesting reading along because it talks a lot about eugenics and basically like a a, a fight against the poor or a fight against certain people or like they there was doctors in the 60s who were planting iud's in women so that they couldn't have children and like all these different measures that they were considering to make sure population control wouldn't like that they could do it that it wouldn't get 
out of control. It's a bittersweet pill to swallow because I think we all, similar to the thoughts people have probably had listening to your story, we don't want over, we do not want overpopulation, and we also think that it's an issue, but we don't want that to be placed upon us. Yeah, and, we don't want to pay that price. And how do you even control it? I mean, mm. we've got China who has the the implemented one or possibly two children rule, but I mean, look at their population; it's it's the largest in the world with India if not equal, getting really close to that. And so even countries that have these so-called things in play to be able to limit it, how useful is it? And so I think at the beginning, I was trying to, to at least for when the US was speaking, I was trying to at least say, yeah, we've made some attempts, but it's not enough. Yeah. Um, so at what point are the efforts we make to limit population I don't think planting or making all men sterile or doing all these different things, how much would it really can affect the growth that it that it's already at? Well, I have a strong hunch, wink, wink, that population control is not done and fully behind us on alternate endings because I've had some stories with some curveballs. Ooh. And I remember when you first told me about this story, the, the combination of two things together that, that made it very unsettling for me was this was a pre-planned war i thought th that idea alone was fascinating and then layer on population control you know altruistically looking at it objectively it's a good idea it's it's a great to, way to lim to reduce all the things that are that cause problems for right. this planet. Just to think that there's some ceiling we should stay under as a race to responsibly inhabit the world. But nobody wants genocide. Nobody no. wants to die. Nobody wants to sacrifice themselves for this. So it's a painting we all want to see, and nobody's willing to lay the first stroke. And I don't think it should be. But, I mean, this is obviously a call for something to be done because... Like you said, even if it isn't necessarily about war, no one wants to make that effort to make sure that we're, it, oh, it's difficult to, to do these things. Oh, it's difficult to have renewable energy. Like it's so expensive to do that or it's so expensive to recycle. You and I were just talking about yesterday about how in Weld County, they don't recycle anymore because it's too expensive. Like all these things that are would make an impact on bettering this planet, it comes down to money. Mm, and convenience and how much will I sacrifice compared to the person next to me? And what effort do I want to put forth? And I feel like those efforts can be contagious. You know, just seeing someone taking an extra step to make the world a little healthier on a global scale can be infectious. Yeah, I mean, look at Trash Tag Challenge. Like, that's all over the internet. And if not quite as much as it used to be, I still see it pop up with new people saying, hey, look at this area I just cleaned up. Or, hey, look, we have 30 bags of trash that we pulled from this field. Obviously, that goes, unfortunately, to some other location and just mm -hmm. ends up dumped again. But I think it's little things like that that people see, hey, other people, like you said, it's infectious. Hey, they're making an effort. I should make whatever effort I can. I'm going to use less water today. I'm going to, oh, there's that piece of trash on the floor. As I'm walking down the sidewalk, I'm going to put that in that trash can just so mm -hmm. it doesn't end up somewhere else. Couldn't have said it better myself. As we close out the recap here, any last thoughts about Resolution End for our listeners? You know, listeners, I just want to say love each other, you know, love yourselves, love this planet, and and you should love me too. And don't participate in proxy wars ahead of time. Yeah, please don't. That's that's all I've got to say. I mean, it's it's not the right thing to do. Even though you wrote about it. I, I did write <laughs> about it. You got to fantasize about I, it. I had to. I mean, <laughs> the idea just came to me, and I hope you all enjoyed it. And with that, death comes for us all. Thank you all for listening. Next episode, we return with a brand new audiobook story. Talk to you soon. Assuming the world is still standing by then. We would like to thank Kevin McLeod for his music found on incompetech.com.